Today I'd like to share a series that I imagine many of you have seen from some of the top YouTubers, and even more of you have probably played it yourself. It's a series about friends, personal growth, and of course, puzzles. Starting with a small Flash game started by its creator when he was only 11 years old has been adored for well over a decade now. The series' development may have been wrought with highs and lows, but in the end has earned millions of plays and views, with a story and characters that grew alongside its fanbase. This is John Bro's Riddle School. How's it going guys, my name is Graham and welcome to Two Left Thumbs. This is Flashlight, a series where I talk about the history of all things Flash related here on the internet. I was able to talk to John briefly to fill in a few gaps, but I didn't end up doing a proper interview. He has done his own developer commentary on this series, so I feel like that really gives his own opinion, his personal take, and answers a lot of the bigger questions that people might have had, so I don't really want to retread that ground. Instead, let's look at the somewhat tumultuous and unexpected success of this series. Riddle School was started back in May 2006 by John Bro, who nowadays can be found instead under the name Jonachrome. At an age when most of us likely didn't even know software like Flash existed and couldn't conceive of making our own game, John had already done it. The game was small, simple, with somewhat mismatched art styles and oddly bald children. Nevertheless, the first Riddle School was released, with no indications of what a massive success it would eventually become. I managed to pick up a few snapshots of this through the Wayback Machine. We can see that the first Riddle School didn't even debut with a particularly high score. Several weeks after its release, its average score was sitting at a 6.73 out of 10. For anyone unfamiliar, Newgrounds has daily and weekly awards for the top scoring content, and Riddle School won none of those. People who played it seemed to enjoy it, yet it remained relatively unassuming. But the humor was snarky, the goal was relatable, the animation was serviceable, it was a perfectly decent game. All of this is all the more impressive realizing John is still only 11 years old. In fact, in my mind, taking that into consideration, the game is pretty much a masterpiece. Having forayed into Flash and games myself, I hadn't even learned how to tween a stick figure across the screen, let alone putting a game out there that's so cool. Right off the bat, we get our familiar characters of Smiley, Fred, and Zack alongside Phil, the protagonist. You can see that all these minor characters had equally limited designs and completely one-dimensional personalities, yet they would eventually grow into their own and become Phil's closest friends and companions. I love the commitment to continuity throughout this. Small decisions that were made on the fly for a game that was released for nobody but himself, they suddenly become the core quartet of the series. Core quartet. Took a few takes to get out. The school setting of the game was inspired by the very popular Pico school, with the character design mostly being the body shape, hands, and head, all acting as a relic of this originally being a madness game. The idea then being that the game would take place in a setting similar to Pico with madness characters, shooting your way out to escape. Eventually this was abandoned and a more approachable, child-friendly game was born out of two famously violent, very inappropriate series. Ah, Newgrounds. The place where youngins could go watch all the horribly reviled media that our parents were afraid we were getting from TV and movies. Good times. That relatively iconic character design, baldness included, UI, grayscale classroom objects, and main soundtrack are all still remnants of this influence. Mathness being written across the chalkboard is a subtle nod to this origin. While this would have been interesting to see, I'm sure we're all very happy that John went his own route instead. In his own commentary, he talks about how he never intended to make a second game, but there were some encouraging words in the reviews and people gave suggestions of what could be improved. So he took that to heart and decided to put it into practice. I think the lesson here being, put more encouraging words and support out into the world rather than putting people down and focusing on the negatives. Your kind words might lead to them making a new favorite game or franchise of yours. I'm not saying you can't critique things, but those are my two cents on instead giving constructive criticism. Anyways, I'll pull my head out of my own butt. Later that same year, we saw the release of Riddle School 2. The game completely revamped everything. Amazingly, not even the simplest designs were reused. With one notable exception, the now somewhat infamous sink. Well, I don't know if anyone but me pays attention to this sink, but if you never have before, I want you to start now. Then I won't be the only one driven crazy by the weird choice to only reuse this one asset. John took it as sort of a personal challenge to redo the art each time. Partly because my style and design sense were developing, and partly because the characters had to be redrawn anyways as they were getting older. He said the one exception might have been Riddle Transfer 2, but by the time he made that, his original source files were long gone. 
Riddle School 2 had a much stronger reception, earning a daily second place and being front page, a position that is still highly coveted to this day. These are all hand-selected features. You're guaranteeing much more exposure. The changing setting, aging characters, and beginnings of giving Phil and the other characters more personality is where I think the love of this series really began. Fans were attracted to a new warmth that was present here. Or we can imagine ourselves attending the school and hanging out with these distinct classmates. This having number two at the end, people obviously went back to the original to see where it all began. Only a month after Riddle School 2, the original game had raised up to a 7.29. Nowadays Newgrounds uses a 5 star system instead of 10, but with some very simple mathness we can see that the current score has been raised up to an 8.9. It's been carried a long way through its recent cult status. The wait between games for Riddle School 3 was much longer at roughly 16 months. But again, John surprised us by widening the scope of what a Riddle School game could be. Phil and friends are now attending high school, the school itself is larger than ever, and we see the most dramatic shift so far in overall art and character design. All the staples that make this series a classic are still in place, the dry sarcastic humor, memorable characters, and plenty of puzzles. At this point it appeared John was still having fun with the series, not overthinking the process. But I imagine once you've made a trilogy of games about escaping a school, that well starts to feel a little bit dry. Post Riddle School's re-release seemed to have a marked shift in development attitudes. I mean, John was now a teenager himself, with all the wonderful self-doubt and insecurities that come along with that. You're old enough to have your own thoughts on things, but not quite old enough to have the autonomy to do much with it. It's a frustrating time for anyone. Suddenly these games had hundreds of thousands of views, had won several awards, and had a growing fan base. For the first time, John is working under a weight of success, and feelings of needing to match expectations that weren't previously there. You're no longer just making these games for yourself and maybe some close friends. Development began on Riddle School 4, titled Riddle University early on, and we received several teases, including this intended design for Phil, but in these blog posts John indicated that he hadn't worked on the game in months. Roughly a year after Riddle School 3's release, John joked that it had gone the way of Pico 2, long teased but never completed. Come December 2009, Riddle School 4 had officially been cancelled. After a year and a half of fans hounding John to continue the series, he threw his plans out entirely. The pressure of a previously non-existent fanbase and expectations for the franchise were overwhelming. Cut to April 2010, people logged into Newgrounds to see that their dreams had not been dashed after all. Only a few short months after cancellation, Riddle School 4 was real and it had been released. It seemed that maybe John had changed his tune. Many, many fans opened the game excited to jump back into their beloved series, only to realize that no matter where you click or what you do, Phil dies by falling into a volcano under the school. A quick glance at the date revealed that this was an April Fool's joke. Like they say, all good jokes have a kernel of truth. John was adamant that there would not be another Riddle School 4. For anyone who came looking, this was it. He took the one scene of the game that he had completed, added this ending cutscene, and claimed it was his way of adding finality to things. With the main character now dead, there was no way for the series to continue. Really, I can't think of any better way to get the fans off of your back by giving them what they asked for, but then slapping their hand away when they reach out for it. Maybe they don't come asking a second time. It was kind of a tragic, unceremonious end to the series. But at least everyone could move on. We still had the original three games to enjoy for years to come. But wait! Dramatic reveal! Only 24 hours later, with no prior teasing or clues given, John dropped Riddle School 5. Chatting about it now, John told me that it was actually his mom's idea to release the game on April 1st. His original plan was to release it the same day he added the volcano cutscene in weeks earlier. I feel like this is the same advice that people give where you write a letter angry, set it aside for 24 hours and see if you still want to send it out the next day. This piece of sage advice from Mama Bro gave John time to reflect on the joke, and really think about how it might sit with fans. John tells me, in that time I had devised a new plan to stop people from asking for more Riddle School games. Which if Riddle School 4 didn't put people off, the plan was to take the series completely off the rails and oversaturate it with as many games as I had time to make. I teased him that it sounded like his plan was to drive the series into the dirt out of spite. He conceded that that's one way to look at it, but at that point it was more about joking around with his friends. There was a little less focus on fan reception. In the process of oversaturating, that turned out to only be one game, so I made it count and ended up having a lot of fun with it. So from my own perspective, for anyone keeping track, we can thank the fans for Riddle School 2, and I think we can thank John's mom for the entire second half of the series. 
Suddenly the characters are now children again. We learn that they were abducted by aliens, and that the previous games, Riddle School 4 included, were all a part of induced dreams that you could only escape by dying. In a fun nostalgia romp nine years before Endgame did it, we get to revisit the previous games, interacting with your friends, and killing them to wake them up from those dreams. The deaths are really creative and a lot of fun. I like the fact that it's something John wouldn't have planned. Same as Phil kind of having to MacGyver his way through this. From a design perspective, John was in the same place. These games weren't made as a setup for Riddle School 5, where you inevitably come back and become a murderer. So thanks to this, we end up with really weird things based around the existing assets in these games. Riddle School 5 really broke the mold of what the series could be, showing a massive improvement in both John's design and puzzle crafting while also highlighting his own need for a more creative setting. Moving outside the usual tropes of school being boring and prison-like ushered in a new era. In a way, it reminds me of later seasons of Community, a series set in a school that has a limited number of stories to tell, but when the heart of the series is in the characters and the adventures they go on, school serves only as a jumping off point rather than the actual center of things. Suddenly, this simplistic series was in space with aliens, dream traversing, sci-fi elements, plot twists, and more. But it's the characters, the snarky humor, the puzzles, and everything everything else that make it a Riddle School game. For that reason I like that this is still titled Riddle School 5. Eventually the naming changed. Obviously this game really goes beyond the scope of a school, and the series did end up shifting entirely after, but this game was still rooted in that origin. So whether it's intentional or not, across the seven games I, I really like that this one maintained that name. In the extras of Riddle School 5, a fun recurring thing that Riddle School does and I wish more Flash games did, John shared some of his rejected Riddle School ideas, several of which he had even started to draw up. There was an Ace Attorney-like game, Riddle Manor, playing as like a detective character, and a bunch of other ones, all of which he had abandoned for his own specific reasons. We can see here where the gears are kind of grinding, and John's not really confident where he wants to take the series next. Luckily, he was able to discover a new creative foothold. Riddle 5 was a smash success, earning a daily first, weekly third, and monthly fifth. And while the other games had obviously opened up some interest in past installments, this game really begged players to play the originals. Through this one they may have seen snippets of those past games, but there was a flurry of renewed interest to begin the series for the first time or revisit them if you hadn't played in years. The expanded characters and lore actually add new retrofitted depth even to the incredibly simplistic Riddle School 1. Suddenly, these small little choices from an 11-year-old feel really impactful and important. This creative reinvigoration and critical acclaim launched John in pursuit of the franchise's future. If fans were willing to accept the series moving beyond the school, then more than ever, he was free to do whatever he liked. Maybe he could even introduce, oh, I don't know, a goat character that becomes one of critical importance to the franchise and an absolute fan favorite? Well, yes and no. Yes, he could do that if he wanted. No, I don't think it's anyone's personal favorite. John and I would chat from time to time back then as well, at a time when my super cool internet handle was Goatman. I've talked about that before, I, I don't feel the need to get into that now. The goat also served as a mascot for myself and was featured in several animations. Talking with John about doing this video, he told me, don't you dare leave out the part where you're in Riddle Transfer. And I wouldn't dream of it. It's really amazing to be a part of such a special series that means so much to so many people. I still remember what an incredible surprise it was even to myself when I first played the game. And it's something I still come back to now and again and think of very fondly. So thank you so much for that, John. It means as much now as it did back then. Our new game would begin in Area 5.1, tying together the alien elements while bringing our heroes back to Earth and opening up a plethora of new otherworldly options. I think it was a logical and fun progression for the franchise. Throughout production, John struggled with motivation, but set his sights high. When Riddle Transfer dropped the sixth in the series, it was announced as the first of a new set of five games. With this first game being by far the biggest yet, this meant that John was intending to spend years working on this franchise. This is traditionally what you would call biting off more than you can chew. It's difficult to announce even a single game's release. We see projects get cancelled all the time in the game world, but anyone will tell you that attempting to map out five right off the bat is going to be difficult to see through. One exception I can think of is James Cameron, and that dude is worth $700 million. He's maybe got the resources to dedicate his time to five installments of a series. A lot more challenging challenging for a 16-year-old dev struggling with motivation and trying to find their voice creatively. Hell, even the likes of George R.R. R. Martin can't seem to pull it off, with all the support in the world backing him up. As we all know now, there is definitely not five Riddle Transfer games. Hindsight really is 2020, eh? I'm not meaning to bash John for setting his ambitions high. It's that same shoot for the moon attitude that has seen him working on his dream project for years now. He's done plenty of videos on it and he shares lots of teases on his Twitter. If you're curious about what kind of things he makes these days, that's absolutely worth following up on. 
So for anyone curious, yeah, he's still around, he still makes games, and seems to have very greatly advanced his tool set of creation. We're all still rooting for you, Johnny bro. Anyways, this Riddle Transfer series was expected to take several years of development time. Originally, he planned to make all five at once and then schedule the releases. This roadmap was abandoned after Riddle Transfer 1 took six months. The ambition was to reinvigorate people's passion for point-and-click games and show the potential of Flash in general. Keep in mind this is taking place years before Double Fine's adventure game Kickstarter, which eventually became Broken Age, that proved point-and-click still had a strong fan base. In that regard, John was really ahead of his time, especially at only 16 years old. Here's a quote of his I really like. Often players are either required to skew their thinking to match the logic of the game developer, or look at a walkthrough because the logic is so obtuse. Some developers compensate for this lack of clarity by dropping 10-ton hints everywhere, but when the puzzles are too reliant on hints, there is no epiphanies or sense of discovery involved. As work on the series progressed, John gradually lost motivation, feeling future installments would be more of the same without contributing to the goal of showing off Flash games' full potential. His goal had never been internet fame, and with his heart no longer in it, any continuation risked being hollow fanservice. In July 2012, the series and all future plans were officially cancelled. An outline of the intended series was shared, allowing desperate fans to feel some small sense of closure. That intended roadmap still exists online for anyone who might be curious, but knowing his motivations now, and seeing the story he had in mind, it was probably the right call. It's easy to see how John would have lost interest in telling this story. The broad story beats involved once again being captured and escaping from jail cells, fan service visitation of the rejected Riddle School games, once again in a prison-like school and freeing your friends, ending with Riddle Transfer 5 in a lab environment, set up to feel reminiscent of a playground, tying the school aspect back into things. He had a few plot twists in mind and a main villain arc. The final game would end with Phil being tossed into a volcano, similar to the joke of Riddle School 4, with Phil clutching the edge and his life flashing before his eyes, and in those final moments he would play as Phil's friends instead, working to save his life, just as he had saved theirs so many times before. After saving everyone and wrapping up a few plot details, the plan was to have a slideshow showing Phil grow older and relive his school years, ending with Phil at university. While all the plot beats were not entirely in place, it did give us some nice emotional through lines, and stayed true to the heart of the series that your friends will always be there for you. I love the idea of flipping it around and Phil being saved at the end instead, it really gives closure to that whole concept. At this time, John said he was not comfortable with fan continuations, and just wanted things to be left alone. The series had been so close to him since he himself was a child, it only makes sense he'd want to remain protective over that. Nearly three years later, he did walk back this perspective. John felt that if he was not going to make an official ending, maybe he ought to allow the freedom for fans to produce unofficial endings. While this did spawn numerous fan fictions, Minecraft skins, as well as several unrelated games inspired by Riddle School, we never did see anyone attempt to create their own Riddle Transfer 2. There was a lot to live up to. Maybe people started to realize the weight John was living under. Towards the end of 2015, he released his own fan game, One Night at Flumpties, another game that I'm certain many of you have seen, heard of, or played before. With this, he suddenly has a whole new wave of fans and success. While I'm sure that brought back a lot of familiar baggage and some of the same feelings, with hungry fans desperate for more, it also served as proof that John could escape Riddle School and be known for other things. He doesn't recall having those exact feelings at the time, but there is a good chance it contributed to a raised confidence as a creator. May 2016 was coming up and set to mark the 10-year anniversary of Riddle School. Towards the beginning of the year, I reached out and asked John if he was opposed to me making a Riddle School 1 remake. Hopefully some of you have seen the result of that return to Riddle School. I had a lot of fun with it. In my mind, it was the entry in the franchise that obviously aged the most. It was made in a time before Riddle Riddle School had truly become Riddle School, fully in terms of art, style, gameplay, and obviously made without the knowledge of the future franchise. It was mostly meant to be practice for myself, but I wanted to give it a fresh coat of paint, expand the game some, and tie in more directly to the future games. John signed off on this, thought it was a fun idea, provided a unique piece of art for me to stick in a classroom, and I was finally able to properly thank him for the GOAT's inclusion in Riddle Transfer years earlier. For anyone who's planning to ask, no, I won't be doing other Riddle remakes. The other games are actually amazing polished, and I don't think there's a lot I could add there. As we kept talking around this time, he let me know that he was rethinking the idea of continuing the series. There were no firm plans, but he was coming around on the idea. It ended up being a perfect storm for a conclusion. He had an idea, the motivation to do it, and the time to see it through. In a matter of weeks, John was able to begin work on actually crafting his final installment, a game that was stunningly able to provide closure in every way to the rest of the series, while once again redoing everything from scratch and delivering a game as long and deep as the other big installments of the franchise. This was 
was not phoned in or rushed. The game took us on a familiar yet new adventure, putting renewed focus on Phil's friendships, reveling in the ways that the series Phil, John, and us had all simultaneously grown along with it. We even got the montage intended for Riddle Transfer 5, with the emotional impact of it dialed up to 11. I have no idea how John was able to crawl out from under the weight of this series, and all this time later not feel like a mockery of itself, but he really pulled it off. It's a really fantastic game. Around that time, leading up to the release of my own Return to Riddle School, and with the 10 year anniversary around the corner, I thought it would be a good idea to do my own Riddle School playthrough on my own channel. And by pure coincidence and a huge stroke of luck, Dan the Diamond Minecart did his own playthrough around the same time. A YouTuber with millions of subscribers introduced the series to a new generation while reminding others of an old favorite of theirs, right around the time John was opening back up to the idea of finishing the series. With Dan having no knowledge of the anniversary or the fact that the conclusion was on the way, it was purely coincidence. The timing couldn't have been better for John and for myself. It was kind of crazy getting swept up in that. The channel was really struggling and for the first time ever I saw a subscriber bump. I feel like I really needed that little support and motivational push to keep going with things. It was really encouraging, and I maybe wouldn't have stayed with it if that hadn't happened. Asking John about the creation of Riddle Transfer 2 now, he said the key influences would have been 1. Dan playing the games, renewing interest in things, the 10 year anniversary coming up, and the creator of FNAF, Scott Cawthon's sentiment that it's okay to follow your inspiration even if it takes you back to the same place again and again. With that in mind and his fans backing him up, John was able to provide an ending at the time when people were most desperate for it in a 4 year period. While my struggling Let's Play channel got its first major bump in subscribers while people were frantically looking up Riddle School content. Honestly that was huge for me. It may seem small but that was when we hit 100 subscribers. Riddle School is a series I've always loved and have had personal attachments to for many reasons. That also means that this video is one I've always wanted to make, but have similarly felt scared of the weight of doing it justice. Now that we're a few years removed from the conclusion and all that excitement, the timing feels right to simply gush and share with everyone, including John, how much I love Riddle School and what the series means to me. It's kind of funny writing out this video and realizing what a similar headspace that is to where John was probably at, being frightened of your own ability to meet expectations. As we ended our chat, John quickly recommended a few indie games that he feels don't get enough attention. I want to quickly share those with you, and maybe they're things that you guys can look up after doing a Riddle School replay. Whoopo, a weird colorful adventure created as the passion project of two friends. Rising Dusk, a coin avoision puzzle platformer that feels fresh and unique. And Squirm, a game short and sweet with a surprising amount of depth if you give it a chance. Also, very cheap. And to top it all off, he is also currently playing the massive and ambitious Jimmy and the Pulsating Mass, a game that I actually did a 40 plus hour let's play on and plan to cover on this channel too. Seriously, play this game, it's humongous, wacky, ambitious, creative, and unique in all the best ways. Somehow, against all odds, a franchise started by an 11 year old managed to span 7 installments and bring joy to users for a full decade. Think about that. At the time of Riddle Transfer 2's release, John had dedicated half of his life to this franchise. It's hard not to get a little emotional about these silly, melon-headed children. Each individual game has millions of plays on new grounds alone. The series always challenged itself to be better, offering up more complex puzzles and deeper emotional connections for the players. The true heart of the game, those bonds of friendship, is something that everyone can strive for and enjoy in their own way. It's pure, sweet, simple, and inspiring. Let me say just one more time, Thank you, John. It really was a wonderful journey, and thank you for bringing us all along with you.